All right, good morning, everybody. It is 10.59. We're going to wait about 60 seconds, let people log in, and then we will get started here shortly. Uh, so hang tight, and uh, we'll start uh, in just a few seconds. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is 11 o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started today. Um, I'd like to try to start on time and try to end on time so that we can be courteous of your time. So thank you, everybody, for choosing to uh, take a little bit of time out of your schedule to learn about 1031 Exchange. Um, I have to tell you, these webinars are a lot of fun for me to do because I get to get away from my five-year-old. Um, I've been, we've been doing homeschooling for our five and our eight-year-old, and uh, I just spent all morning trying to convince my five-year-old to read and write, and it's not very fun. So, looking forward to uh, interacting with some adults and some professionals as opposed to five-year-olds. So, very excited about today's webinar. So, my name is Leonard Spoto, and uh, I'm going to be your host today. This is me. You can see me on your computer screen. I run a company called Asset Exchange Company. We are a 1031 exchange accommodator. So um, a couple announcements before we start. Um, this is our 1031 exchange basics class, okay? So this class is the first of a series of webinars that we do. We go over the fundamentals of the 1031 exchange. This is a great class if you need a refresher or if you know nothing about 1031 exchanges, okay? So um, that's what we're doing today. If you have questions during the course of today's webinar, I would encourage you to get your question on, on over to me. The way that you ask questions during a webinar is you simply type them in and your question will pop up on my computer screen. Now, um, each of you should have a control panel for your webinar, and there's a question section on that control panel. If you want to ask a question, open that up, type your question in, and boom, it'll come on over to me. So Michael uh, has asked, will this webinar be replayed or saved online? And absolutely, all of our webinars are recorded. And then at the end of the webinar, you will get an email from us. You'll get a copy of the webinar presentation that you can download, and we will also include a link to our uh, recorded version of this webinar, okay? So, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk 1031 Exchange. And the most important thing that I have to um, talk about right now because of the uh, shelter in place and the coronavirus is the taxpayer relief that has been provided by the IRS for people currently in a 1031 exchange, okay? So I'm starting off all my webinars with um, this update from the IRS. On April 9th, uh, the IRS came out and they notified us that if you have a current 1031 exchange, that you will get an extension on your day 45 and your day 180, but only if your day 45 or your day 180 falls between July excuse me, April 1st and July 15th, okay? So if you have a day 45 that falls between April 1st and July 15th, or a day 180 that falls between April 1st and July 15th, you get that date pushed back to July 15th, all right? Does that make sense? I know it's a little confusing. It's not a great 
extension. We were hoping for something different, but this is what the IRS gave us. So let me give you an example here, okay? So example number one, we have a guy named Bob. He sold his property on March 1st, so that would push his day 45 deadline to April 15th, which falls within that sweet zone. And the IRS is saying, you know what? you're going to get an extension to July 15th on day 45 now. Okay, so if you have a day 45 following in that time frame, you're automatically getting the day 45 extended to July 15th. Now, let's look at scenario number two. We've got a lady named Sue. She sold her property way back in October. Her day 180 falls on April 1st, which is in our sweet spot. So her day 180 is automatically extended to July 15th. Now, the problem is she gets no relief on her day 45 ID letter. Okay, that's a bummer, right? So what we have done as an industry, the National Association of Realtors, the 1031 exchange industry, we have all gone to the IRS and say, hey, these extensions, extensions you gave us, they kind of stink. They're not very good. We don't like them. Are you going to do something else? There's a lot of confusion around these guidelines as well that they came out. So we are asking the IRS and the Treasury Department for more clarification and frankly, just a better extension, right? So what if you uh, stuck at home and you can't go out and ID, uh, you, know, you know, what do we do then? So these ID deadlines um, could change. We could get further relief or the IRS could say, hey, sorry, Charlie, this is what we gave you. Go out and get your deals done. Okay, so as we know more, we're going to let you guys know. But that is the most pressing thing in the 1031 exchange industry right now. Okay, so I'm starting off my presentation with that because a lot of people are asking what kind of relief 1031 exchange clients get because of this COVID-19 situation. And ladies and gentlemen, that is it. All right. So back to our regularly scheduled program here, 1031 exchange basics. So. As I mentioned, my company is a 1031 exchange accommodator. Ladies and gentlemen, we do not sell real estate. We do not buy real estate. We don't sell title insurance or provide escrow services. The only thing that my company does is work with 1031 exchange clients to facilitate 1031 exchanges. So for those of you who have never done a 1031 exchange before, you need to work with an accommodator, a 1031 exchange company. All right, that's what we are. We are going to do three very important things when you do an exchange. We're going to hold the sale proceeds, we're gonna prepare all the legal documents, and we're gonna make sure that clients are in compliance with the tax code, all right? You cannot do a 1031 exchange without an accommodator. I actually just got off a phone call this morning from a lady who said, my parents sold their property five months ago, now they wanna buy something. Can they do it? And I said, well, they closed five months ago, right? And she said, yeah. I said, well, did you have your exchange account set up? She said, no. I said, well, there's no 1031 exchange then. You cannot touch your money. You have to have an accommodator hold the sale proceeds for you if you want to buy replacement property and do an exchange. And she said to me, well, geez, Leonard, I thought I had 180 days. Well, yeah, you do. But you can't touch the money during those 180 days. You need all the legal documents in place before you close. And then the company that you work with for your exchange, the accommodator is going to make sure you're following all the rules. So for those of you, again, this is a beginner class who have never done an exchange before. One of the most important things that you want to realize when you're working with investors selling exchange property is get your exchange account set up before you close escrow. Okay. Now, I can get your exchange account set up today if you're closing tomorrow. Obviously, we would like more time, and most of our clients will set up their exchange account well before they close. Usually, the day they open up escrows, the day they call us up to set up the exchange account. But some clients don't make up their mind until later, and some clients don't even know that it is an option to do an exchange until the last minute. We can help those clients out, but we cannot help you if you've closed escrow, all right? So get us involved, the sooner the better. Now, 
please stay back a bit from your microphone. There we go. Okay, will do. Sorry about that, guys. Had my microphone right up in my throat, so <laughs> sounds like that's not a good option. All right. So my company, we've been doing business since 2006. I've been in the exchange industry for about 20 years. Back in 2006, I started this company. Um, we do about 150 exchanges per month. So we've been around. We do a lot of deals. Um, we've seen it all and we've done it all. There's probably not a 1031 exchange situation that you could run by us that we probably haven't already seen before. So we've got the expertise to help you out and we'd like to do so if you have exchanges coming up. All right. So let's talk 1031. All right. So for you newbies who have no clue what a 1031 exchange is, section 1031 of the Internal Revenue Code simply allows a seller of an investment or business use property to defer taxes. All right, that's the big kind of high level overview. If your client says, well, what's an exchange? You gotta say, think two things. Number one, investment property, and number two, tax deferral, all right? You're gonna have clients who ask you if they can exchange their home, if they're gonna buy another home. That is not possible, right? Section 1031 of the Internal Revenue Code is only for investment or business use properties, and it is only a tax deferral. But ladies and gentlemen, it is one of the single greatest wealth building tools available to an investor. If you are looking to build wealth by building up a real estate portfolio, you have the opportunity to never pay taxes on any of your transactions. You can use the money that would have gone to the government to reinvest into your next deal. And this is powerful because in California, where I think most of you are, 33% of your gain goes to pay taxes. If you do not have to pay that, you can keep hundreds of thousands of dollars in your pocket and use that money to leverage into your next deal. You cannot do that with stock. If you sell Google stock, you cannot defer your taxes. If you sell IBM stock, there is no tax break available for you. So real estate is a very unique asset. And it is one of the most, if not the most, tax-advantaged investment. And it is one of the best ways to build wealth and pass on wealth to future generations. Okay? So very important that you understand how this works. Now, what I'm going to give you is the magic formula for doing a 1031 exchange. Here it is. Number one, you have to understand the 1031 exchange rules. And I say that, but if you take this webinar and you forget 95% of what I share with you today, that's fine as long as you remember my phone number because understanding and knowing the rules is essential to completing a success, successful exchange, but you don't have to be a tax attorney, right? I've got a tax attorney on my team. We're going to make sure that all the rules and all the compliance issues are taken care of, but it's important that you know there are rules so you don't screw up, okay? Number two, very important that you secure replacement property. You do not have a 1031 exchange if you don't go out and buy replacement property, right? So that is often the most difficult part of the exchange process. And then finally, you're gonna need to build a top-notch team, right? You can't do this on your own. You have to have an accommodator. You have to have an escrow team. You have to have title insurance. So you want those people in place and you want the best. All right, we're going to make the case to you hopefully today that we are the best and hopefully you work with us. So let's talk 1031 exchange. Now, there are several different ways in which you can structure your 1031 exchange. Now, some people will say uh, that they heard that you have to sell and buy on the same day. That's called a simultaneous exchange. And prior to 1972, yes, that's how you had to structure your 1031 exchange, where you sold and you bought simultaneously. But you don't have to do that anymore, okay? Yes, you can if all the stars align. You can sell and buy on the same day. 
But you don't have to because the IRS in 1972 gave us guidance for how to do what's called a delayed exchange where you sell and then take up to 180 days to buy. All right. 95% of all of the exchanges that we facilitate are regular delayed exchanges. Your client's going to sell, close escrow today, and then sometime within the next six months, they're going to buy replacement property to complete their exchange. That is called a delayed exchange. Now, two other options for clients in doing an exchange. You've got the reverse exchange and you've got a construction or an improvement exchange. Now, we do not go into a lot of detail on these two types of exchanges in today's class because these are very rare. Only about 5% of our clients will do these type of exchanges, but they are worth noting that they are possible. A reverse exchange allows you to buy first and then you have 180 days to sell. All right, so you're doing your exchange instead of a delayed exchange where you sell first and then buy, you're doing the opposite with a reverse exchange. You are buying first and then you have 180 days to sell. Now, reverse exchanges are really tough and they're really expensive. That's why they're rare, all right? We teach a whole class on reverse exchanges, so we're not gonna get into a lot of detail today on that other than to let you know that it is possible. And then our final exchange, which is a construction improvement exchange. Again, a more expensive and complicated transaction, but with a construction improvement exchange, you are allowed to use 1031 exchange dollars to build or improve a property. All right, so you can actually use 1031 exchange tax deferred dollars to build a property. But there's a lot of strings attached and you've got a time frame which is really challenging to build with it. So these two types of exchanges, they're complex, they're expensive, and literally they only work for a very small percentage of our clients. So chances are you could do 30 or 40 years worth of real estate transactions and never do a reverse or a construction exchange. All right, but I do want to let you know that they are possible and a lot of people ask about them. So we do cover them really quickly in our 1031 Exchange Basics class. But today we're gonna to spend most of our time talking about the most common type of exchange, which is a delayed exchange. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into it. Let's talk about delayed exchanges. When you do a delayed exchange, there are four basic requirements that you need to follow in order to do your exchange properly. All right, so we're going to talk about each and every one of these here, and we're going to start off with property qualifications, or what I call guideline number one in an exchange. And this is going to answer Thomas's question and also Daniel's question. So when you do an exchange, you can only exchange properties that have been held for productive use in trade or business or for investment. And when you do an exchange, you have to trade for properties that are like kind. Now, there is a lot of misinformation about this requirement, about what type of properties qualify, all right? Let me clear up the confusion. All properties that are used for production, excuse me, for productive trade or business or for investment will qualify. All properties in the United States anywhere in the United States will qualify. So you can sell a piece of land in Nebraska and do a 1031 exchange for a rental home in Oklahoma. You could sell that rental home in Oklahoma, buy an apartment building in New York, sell the apartment building in New York and buy an office building in Palo Alto. It doesn't matter, all right? So will an owner user builder building be considered an investment? Absolutely. If you have a building that you own and you have your business in it, that is an investment, that it's a business use property. That will qualify for 1031 exchange. All right, so you have a lot of flexibility in the type of real estate that you buy and sell. You also have a lot of flexibility in where you buy and sell, anywhere in the United States. 
Now, there are two important exceptions. Foreign real estate is not like kind to domestic. So if you want to sell your property in Nebraska and you want to buy a bungalow out in Mexico, that's not going to work because you've got to stay in the United States. All right. You cannot sell in California and buy in Mexico, China, Canada. You have to stay in the United States in order for your exchange to be valid. And then the second thing I want to talk about is quick flips. All right. Quick flips are not exchangeable. And the reason why, ladies and gentlemen, is because within the tax code, the tax code specifically prohibits inventory from being exchanged. All right. Inventory is something that you buy with a specific intent to sell to someone else. So if you buy a building and you spend three months fixing it up and then you immediately put that property on the market, that's inventory. What I want to see in order for your exchange to be valid is that you rent the property out for one to two years. You report the rental income on your taxes. You depreciate the property. And you sign your lease, excuse me, you save your signed lease agreements. So that way, if you get audited, you can establish a fact pattern of having this property used as an investment. Now, for Thomas or for my other uh, person who had a question, if it's a property that you use for your business, as long as you use it for your business and it's a legitimate business, and you've done it for one to two years, that property will qualify as well. Now, with that said, people always ask me, well, what if? What if I have a babysitter business in my house? It's not going to work. You live there. And just because you have a kid come once every two weeks and you babysit them, that's not going to fly. But what if you have a child care business? And it's a real business where kids come every single day. Well, that could qualify. A portion of the property at least will qualify. And the portion will be the percentage that has been allocated to your business, that you're actually reporting on your tax filings. So your whole house isn't going to qualify because part of it you don't use for your business, right? Part of your home you sleep in and then maybe a part you have for your child care business. That could qualify. Let me go over another situation. Now, there's not a lot of Airbnb going on right now, but people do have Airbnbs, right? You've got a property in Napa and you occasionally rent it out. Will that qualify for 1031 exchange? Well, it depends, okay? It depends on if you meet the minimum amount of rental days, which is 14. Okay, so all you have to do for an Airbnb to be considered an investment is rent it out for 14 days. But you also have a threshold for how much personal use you can have on the property. You cannot personally use your Airbnb 14 days or 10% of the amount of time it was rented. So, let me give you an example, ladies and gentlemen. You rent out your Napa property for 30 days. You can either use it for 14 days or 10% of the amount of time that was rented, whichever is larger. Okay? So in this case, you can use it for 14 days. If you use it more than that, the government's going to consider it a second home and it is not an exchangeable property. Does that make sense? Let me give you another example. The Napa home you have, you rented it out for 300 days. Well, you can either use it for 14 or 10%, which is 30 days, whichever is larger. So in this case, if you use the property for more than 30 days, it is not a 1031 exchangeable property. Does that make sense? Now, you're going to forget that. Not a big deal. What I want you to remember is the webinar you took with me and my phone number so that in a year 
when your client says, hey, Todd, I've got an exchange property that I want to do with my Napa rental. And you know the clients use the property personally. You're going to say, oh, geez, if you use it a little bit too much, there might be a problem. So let me call Leonard and figure it out. All right? That's what you're going to do. Now, if you can memorize all this stuff and remember it a year later, fantastic. But if you're like me, you probably forget half the stuff as soon as we log off the call today. All right. So Thomas, unfortunately, is a flipper. And uh, I think I answered your question, Thomas. You're not going to be able to do exchanges. Now, Thomas is bummed. Thomas is thinking, dang, I wasted all my time today on this 1031 call. And the guy told me I couldn't do exchanges on my flips. Well, here's what you can do. You can convert your flips into a rental, put a tenant in there for a year, and then you can exchange it. But if all you're doing is fixing it up and flipping it, I'm sorry, Thomas, you've got to pay taxes. All right. So rule number one, make sure your property is qualified. People get in trouble on this. And in fact, people go to jail because of this. Well, there was a realtor who actually did an exchange bought new property and immediately moved into it. She falsified her tax returns to make the property look like a rental. She got audited. And guess what? She had to pay her taxes. She got penalized and fined. And she spent 14 months in jail. So don't screw around with this. Don't try to play tricks with the government. Just follow the rules and you'll be fine. All right? So rule number one, make sure your property is qualified. Rule number two, if you don't want to pay taxes, you have to remember two things. Number one, reinvest all of your cash. And number two, purchase property equal or greater in value. So let me give you an example. You're going to sell this property over here on the left for $1.1 you're going to pay $100,000 in commissions and closing costs, which you can deduct. So your net sales price on this beautiful rental is a million dollars. If you don't want to pay taxes in an exchange, you have to buy replacement rental or investment property for $1 million or more. All of the cash that comes out of the sale comes into the 1031 exchange account. And then you use that cash as a down payment to buy the replacement property. So, a couple questions always come up. Gee, Leonard, I thought I had to only reinvest my profit. My profit was only 200000 so I wanted to go out to Texas and just buy a $200,000 rental home. That does not work. Well, geez, Leonard, when I sell my million-dollar property, I'm only going to get $400,000 in cash. So all I wanted to do was buy a $400,000 rental home. That does not work. Again, if you don't want to pay taxes in a 1031 exchange, you have to replace the net value after commissions and closing costs, and you have to use all of the cash as a down payment. Now, with that said, you've got some flexibility in how you structure your 1031 exchange. You could sell one property and you can buy two, all right? That works. You could sell three properties and you can buy one. You can do multi-property exchanges. You can also trade down in value if you want to pay some taxes. All right, so I sold for a net sales price of $1 million, but my purchase price is only $950. Does that disqualify the entire transaction? Absolutely not. You're just going to pay taxes on the $50,000 difference. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what we call boot. You're going to take some boot, and you're going to pay taxes on that boot. But just that $50,000 is taxed. All right? So if you hear the word boot when your clients are asking you about 1031 exchanges, that's just something, something that's taxable. All right? So you've got some cash that came down, excuse me, came out. That $50,000 wasn't reinvested. 
so they're paying taxes, and that's the boot. Does that make sense? Perfect. All right. So guideline number one is make sure your property is qualified. Guideline number two is replace the value of what was sold and spend all of your cash to defer all of your taxes. Guideline number three, when you do a 1031 exchange. This is the most difficult part of the exchange and what causes my clients the most stress. When they do the exchange, they actually have a time frame in which to complete the entire process. The time frame is 180 days, and that time frame starts the day you close escrow on the sale of your property. You then have six months or 180 days to go out and purchase replacement investment or business use property. So six months to get everything done. But the problem is that within that time frame, you have to identify what you're thinking about buying on day 45. Okay, so you're going to sell a building and you're going to buy something. The government wants to know what you're thinking about buying on day 45. And they not want and they want you to list the properties that you're thinking of buying down in writing. You have to actually nominate. And the problem is you cannot go and print out a list of every property in the on the MLS and say, okay, well, I'll just buy one of these properties. There's 6,000 of them, so I'll just buy one of them. Nope, it doesn't work that way. The government gives you a process for how to identify those properties. You actually have to submit an identification letter, and this is the identification letter that my company provides you. And when you fill out that identification letter, you're gonna choose to use either the three property rule, where you name one, two, or three properties, or you're going to use the 200% rule to fill out this letter. So let's talk about those rules. Most of my clients will use the three property rule to fill out their identification letter. And that allows them to nominate one, two, or three pieces of property that they will buy to complete their exchange. On day 45, when you submit your identification letter and you nominate these three properties, you are then committed to buying one, two, or three of those properties. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot change your identification letter after day 45. What happens if on day 46, property number one gets sold to someone else? Sorry, you can't replace it. What happens if on day 47, property number two burns to the ground? Sorry, you cannot replace it. You've got one property left on your list. And if you do not buy and close on this property within your 180 days, you do not have a valid exchange. Now, what does it mean not to have a valid exchange? Well, it means you pay your taxes on the sale of the original property, right? Not the end of the world. So, for the newbies who have not done an exchange before, the most important part of the 1031 exchange process is obviously to get your exchange account set up with me, but it's also to start looking for suitable replacement property right away. You do not have to wait until day 45 to make offers. You have an exchange time frame that starts the day you close escrow, right? You've got 180 days and your exchange time frame starts the day you close escrow. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen? There's a period of time before you close escrow that your property is in escrow. And usually that's 30 days you can start making offers to buy property way back there. You could close escrow on your replacement property on day five of your exchange. You can close escrow on your replacement property on day 30. If you don't have anything lined up by day 45, that's when you're gonna start nominating. 
your top choices. And nominate wisely because if you can't get any of them, you're out of luck. Now, some of you are thinking, well, geez, Leonard, I don't want to name three properties. I want to name 20. How do I do that? Well, in order to name four or more properties on your identification letter, you have to use what's called the 200% rule. The 200% rule allows you to nominate as many properties as you want. So there's no limit on the number. However, there is a limit on the value of all the real estate. The value of all the real estate cannot exceed 200% of what you sold. So if you identified, excuse me, if you sold a property for a million bucks, you can identify $2 million worth of real estate. That might be six properties. Maybe you go out to Ohio. Maybe it's 20 properties. Doesn't matter. The number is not important. What we care about is the value of all the real estate. All right? So two options for identifying. Most of my clients will use the three property rule because most of my clients will sell one by one maybe sell one by two. However, every once in a while, I have a client who sells a property in California and they go out to Texas and they go, well, geez, I can buy a lot of real estate in Texas. So they go out and buy five, six, 10 pieces of real estate. Okay. If their goal is to buy a lot of small properties, the 200% rule might make sense for them. Now, I've got a couple questions that I'm going to go ahead and address. So let's go ahead and do that. So Brian says, just to clarify, you can change your property within the 45 day. Absolutely, Brian. You don't have to even identify your properties until day 45. So in the first 45 days, you can make offers on 200 different properties. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. So you've got a lot of flexibility. Now, let's summarize here. When you do a 1031 exchange, you've got four basic guidelines. Properties must qualify. If you don't want to pay taxes, you need to purchase property equal or greater in value. You have 180 days to do your exchange. And then what do you need to do on day 45? Well, you need to identify what you're thinking about buying. Okay, a couple other questions have popped up. Jason wants to know, how do I determine the value of all of these properties? Well, you're gonna write down the price that you expect to pay for those properties. And you have to be reasonable. If you're not reasonable, the government can question it and they can invalidate your identification letter. All right, so you need to be reasonable, Jason. If this property is listed for 150 and you put down $10,000 on your ID letter, that's not reasonable. They're going to disqualify your entire exchange based on that. So be careful. A couple other questions have popped up. Brian wants to know, can I use my 1031 exchange dollars to buy bare land? Absolutely. Remember, any type of business or investment real estate, land certainly qualifies. All right, I got a couple other questions. Kim says, can I sell a rental and use the proceeds to build a property? So the problem is Kim actually wants to build a second home on the property where her primary residence exists. What do you guys think about that? Do you think Kim can take 1031 tax-free dollars to build a second home on a property that she already owns? Kim, the answer is a big fat no. You got two problems. Number one, you have to buy or build an investment rental property. Number two, you cannot use 1031 exchange dollars to build on property you already own. Sorry, Kim. Jamie says, can I improve a vacant property using 
1031 exchange dollars. Okay, we just talked about that. Um, it can be done, but not on a vacant piece of land you already own. Marva says, can a commercial property that also has an owner-occupied apartment attached with an empty storefront, which has been vacant for a lot of years, can you exchange that? Okay, lots to unpack there, Marva. So let's go ahead and build a diagram because I like to build stuff, all right? I'm a visual learner just like my five-year-old son, which I've learned during homeschooling. He's very visual. Okay, so we've got a multi-unit building here, and I've got a a tenant in several of the units, and then I live as a primary unit. This is my primary, and then I've got a storefront on the bottom, okay? So there's a store on the bottom. Can I do an exchange on this? What do you guys think? We've got a complex scenario. Well, you can absolutely do a 1031 exchange on the value of the business and investment components of this building. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna figure out what the primary residence component is. And maybe it's 20% of the total value. You can do an exchange on everything except the 20%. So when you sell this building, 80% of it can qualify for 1031. The 20% that you live in will not qualify for a 1031 exchange, but you can take your homeowner's exemption on that portion, all right? So Marva has asked a pretty complex question for our basic class, but it is really good to know that you can actually divide up a property between its two or three different uses, right? So let's go over that again. Let's just simplify it a little bit. I have a tenant in the top unit, and then I live in the bottom unit, all right? If my breakdown between the two units is 50-50, I can do an exchange on the 50% of the building that is rented, and then I can do take my homeowner's exemption on the 50% of the property that I live in, all right? So you're selling one building, Marva, but you're using two different pieces of the tax law for that same property. So think of it like you're selling two completely different properties. You're selling an investment and then you're selling your home. All right. So very good question. We see that all the time. All right. So Brian says, what requirements come into play if you buy bare land? All right. So it depends, Brian. If I sell a rental property, Okay, and I've got a tenant in there. Let's just say it's a rental home and I want to buy a piece of land. I can definitely do a 1031 exchange into this land. But number one, I can't build a primary residence on the land. I need to keep it for its future appreciation. I don't want to start, I don't want to start a development project on it right away and then sell the development as soon as it was done. I want to season that land for at least one to two years, holding it for its appreciation, all right? The other thing, Brian, is when you sell a depreciable asset and you go into land which is not depreciable, you will pay your depreciation recapture tax. So that is well beyond the scope of today's basic 1031 exchange class because we're really digging into the weeds with, with that question. But if you want more information about that, email me. All right, so Zenny. Zenny says, if you have a primary home with a lot that is an ADU and it's leased, can an investor do an exchange on the ADU? Absolutely. So we've got a beautiful home. And then in the back of the home, we've got a little cottage and we rent out the cottage. Can I do a 1031 exchange on the value of that cottage? Absolutely, that works. We just need to know what percentage of the total value of the real estate is allocated to the cottage, right? If you're selling for a million dollars and you're allocating 
to the cottage, well, then you have a $200,000 exchange. Marva says, well, what if the storefront has been vacant? Okay, remember Marva's question? Marva had this building, it was a big one, and we sliced it up and we had, we lived in one of it, we had some tenants, but the storefront on the bottom was vacant. Okay, that's not a problem, as long as you're not personally using it, all right? It's still an investment, it's vacant because you couldn't rent it, but it's still an investment business use property. So you sh still should be able to exchange it. Now I say should because I would wanna know all the facts and circumstances, but in most cases, just because you're having a hard time leasing a property doesn't mean it's not exchangeable. If you personally use the property, that's where the problems come into play. All right, you guys are asking some good questions here today. Oops, sorry. So um, let's go ahead and, and move on. We only have a few more minutes, so I wanna get into just the breakdown of how an exchange works, because people get confused. They say, well, geez, how does this work? What are the steps involved? Well, let's go through this. Step number one, list your rental investment property for sale. Step number two, get an offer. Open up escrow, typical to have a 30-day escrow. Sometime in there, call me. Open up your exchange account. Don't wait until the last minute. If you can avoid that, get me involved right away. When you open up your exchange account, I am going to have my staff prepare all of the necessary paperwork, which you will then sign or your client will sign at escrow when they sign off on all of their other documents. All right. You're going to then close escrow. And then what happens? Well, then the fun begins, ladies and gentlemen. Then your exchange starts, right? The close of escrow is day zero of your 1031 exchange time frame. So your fun is now starting to happen. At the close of escrow, you've got your 180 days. Your clock is ticking. You got day 45, that clock is ticking. At the close of escrow, the escrow offer, officer would normally send you all of your money. But because you are doing exchange, they send this big stack of cash to me, all right? Goes to a custodial account and we issue you a receipt of funds notification. That's a statement of exactly how much money you have in the exchange account, which you're gonna need to show the lender for your new property, right? So they gotta see that the money is sitting somewhere. You're gonna go out and look for replacement property if you already, if you haven't already done so. And on day 45, you're gonna submit your ID letter. You're gonna hopefully get into contract and open up uh, the escrow for the new replacement property. And when you do, ladies and gentlemen, you need to let me know because I am holding your money. And if you need a deposit, I'm gonna send out the deposit for that new property. You're gonna do your due diligence on the new property. You're gonna make sure it's all squeaky clean and you wanna buy it. And when you say go forward, we are going to wire out all of the remaining money in your account so that you can close escrow and complete your exchange by buying suitable replacement property. That is it. Now, if you've never done an exchange before, there's no magic to this. All you're doing is selling property and buying replacement property. That's it. Okay, we're going to handle all the compliance and tax issues. You as an investor or a realtor, you're going to sell property, you're going to buy property. Now, yes, you have a time frame and there's some rules, but really, you're going to sell property, you're going to buy property, and you're going to make sure that I'm involved to make sure everything goes smoothly. So, it's not rocket science. Now, we've got a few minutes left. I'm gonna jump through some frequently asked questions. If you have other questions you wanna get over to me, now is your time to type them in. So let's start off with question number one. Client acquired a rental property 11 months ago. They wanna sell it and exchange it right now. As a real estate professional, what is your advice to them? Can they do an exchange? Well, they can, 
but it's risky. All right. 11 months, they haven't quite owned it for a year. I like to uh, tell clients uh, a minimum one year, but preferably two years or 24 months. If they want to do it, make sure that their CPA is okay with it as well, because a CPA is going to sign their tax returns. If they've got a really aggressive CPA who's super conservative, he or she might not agree to sign their tax returns. All right. So anything aggressive, make sure the client runs past their CPA. But yeah, they can exchange it. There's no rule set in stone. It has to be one to two years, but we know it has to be seasoned as an investment. But your intent on what you intended to do with the property counts a lot too. So there is some gray area in the, in the amount of time that a property has to be owned. 11 months, eh. That could be challenged, so I'd be careful. I'd make sure the CPA is okay with it. Oh, good question here. Client sold some land, or they sold a rental, or who knows what they sold. They sold something, and they want to do a 1031 exchange and buy four mobile homes. Is this allowed? You guys took the class. What's the right answer to this? A big fat no. All right? And remember, they have to buy real estate in an exchange and mobile homes are not considered real estate unless they have a foundation all right if you can back your truck up to it and drive it away that is not real estate it has to be real estate it has to have a foundation or be land okay we talked about this client sold for five hundred thousand and bought for 450. what happens with the fifty thousand dollars that's left over well, a couple things. It can be taxed, right? So they can say, well, geez, just give me the $50,000 that's left over, and they can pay taxes on it. They can use the money to go out and buy another property, or they can use the money to improve the new property in a construction exchange, which, again, we talked about at the very beginning. It's a little bit more complex, so not a lot of people do that. All right. I think this is the last question. Client would like to sell a rental and exchange into a primary residence. Is that possible? Absolutely not. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen? There's a way to do it. What you can do is you can rent the property out for two or more years, and then you can boot the tenants out, and then you can move in. That's a way to get around the rules. All right, rent it out, season that property as a rental on your tax filings for two or more years, boot the tenants out, and then you can move into the property and you should be okay. I say should because if the IRS does an audit and they determine that you knew you were going to move into the property from day one, they could still disqualify it and make you pay your taxes. So you got to be really careful anytime you think about moving into a 1031 exchange property. All right, client bought, excuse me, client would like to sell two properties and exchange into one. We talked about that. Absolutely, that works. And I think we're just going to go ahead and get to the very end because we're going to wrap up now. I've got a few questions that have popped up that I do want to answer from some of you guys out there. So let's go ahead and jump into your questions. All right, Brian wants to know if I have an escrow company that I work with. Absolutely. Um, shoot me an email, Brian, of where you're at, and I will give you a referral to a good escrow company. Um, if you're in California, we've got dozens that we, that we really like. My email address is right here. All right, Zenny. Zenny wants to know, given the current market whereby clients are struggling to get rent, the client is hoping to 1031 their rental and purchase for themselves. You can't do that. All right. You have to purchase an investment property. Santos says, client, can my client purchase a four-unit building if she's selling a single-family rental? Absolutely. Right? You can sell a single-family rental, and you can buy an apartment building. That's not a problem. So Kyle says, what if I sell for $500 and buy for $450, but there's no cash? All right, so let's do that. I sold for $500. 
and I had $300,000 of debt. So, how much cash did I have, ladies and gentlemen? $200,000 of cash. I went out and I bought a new property. I put 200,000 of my cash down, but I only got a loan for 250. So the property I bought was only worth 450. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? I did not buy enough real estate because I did not take on enough debt. Yes, you did spend all the cash, but you did not take on equal or greater debt. So you've got what's called debt relief, Kyle, and debt relief is taxable. Now, you could sell for 500 and you can have $200,000 in cash. All right. You use that cash as a down payment. You contribute another 50,000 and you get a $250,000 loan to buy a $500,000 property. That would work. Yes, you do have some debt relief, but you added additional cash to the transaction, which offsets your debt relief. So we're digging in the weeds again. This is the basic 1031 exchange class. So if you're thinking, what the heck is this guy talking about? Don't worry about it. The rule of thumb that I want you to remember is if you sold for a net sales price of 500, you need to buy for 500 or more. Otherwise, you're going to have some boot. It's either going to be cash boot or debt relief boot. Make sense, Kyle? James, can I rent to myself? James, what do you think? You think the government's going to let you rent a property to yourself? Absolutely not. Okay. Now, if it's a home and you're trying to rent yourself to live in the home, that will never work. But if you go out and you buy an office building and you have a fantastic real estate company called James Realty and James Realty is going to rent the building and all his fabulous agents are going to work there, then yeah, that will work. Now, James says, well, geez, what if I have a corporation and the corporation owns the property, but then it rents it to me? No, not going to work. Okay, if you're trying to use 1031 exchange to buy a property to live in, it will not work no matter how many corporations and offshore accounts you use. Michael wants to know, why do you need to boot the tenant out? Okay, that was a question that referred to moving into your 1031 exchange property. So Michael, unless you want to live with your tenant as a roommate, you're going to have to kick him out if you want to move in, right? Tina, the exchange only seems viable if the two years, the money is made over 250. Okay, so Tina, we're talking about rental properties. Remember, rental properties. You do not get your homeowner's exemption on a rental property. So if you bought a property for $100,000, and you are now selling it for $200,000. The difference of 100 grand is taxed at 33% if you do not do an exchange. There is no exemption, homeowner's exemption for a rental property. The only tax break to avoid this tax bill is the 1031 exchange. Jason, I don't know what your question is. Can Trust use 1031. Can a trust do an exchange? Absolutely. So the trust is going to sell a property and do an exchange. The trust will buy the replacement property. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, you've got two minutes before I have to go and homeschool my five-year-old. So if you have a question burning in your gut, about what we've talked about, you've got 120 seconds to get it over to me before my five-year-old busts through this door with a lizard in his hand and probably slime on his face. Okay, no questions. So it's time to go chase lizards, do homeschool, and eat PBJs with my five-year-old. Ladies and gentlemen, it was a pleasure. We had a great turnout today. 
keep an eye out for the email that will follow this presentation. You can click on a link to download a copy of the presentation. Please do use my email to get a hold of me. If you have an exchange coming up, I think James, you've got an exchange coming up. Please do send over any questions you have, or give me a call. It'll be our pleasure to work with you. Everybody have a fantastic rest of your day. Take care, everyone.